A top U.S. commander says China has fully militarized at least three of the man-made islands it built in the South China Sea. China claims the ocean territory as its own, though it remains disputed. But the commander says Beijing has already armed the small islands with anti-ship and anti-aircraft missile systems, laser and jamming equipment, and fighter jets. U.S. Indo-Pacific Commander Admiral John C. Aquilino talked about the issue over the weekend. He says China's aggression in the area has been happening for the past 20 years, describing it as the largest military buildup since World War II by China. He pointed out these actions come in stark contrast to Beijing's assurances that it would not transform the artificial islands into military bases. Commanding officer for the U.S. Navy Joel Martinez also gave his take. He said his crew monitors all daily changes happening in the South China Sea. He also stressed how important it is for the U.S. to work with the Philippine military in the area. An opportunity to work with the Philippine military is critical right now as we strengthen our ties, our relationships, as we both have a shared vision and a common goal for a free and open Indo-Pacific region. The Chinese Communist Party considers almost the entire South China Sea as part of its own territory, although an international court deemed that claim illegal. The other parties in the area, including the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan and Brunei, also claim part of the sea. Approximately $5 trillion in goods are shipped through the region every year. The United States has no claims in the area itself but has deployed Navy forces for decades to promote free navigation in international waterways. Amid China's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and a volatile virus situation, are Western investors starting to rethink investing in China? A new report shows capital flowing out of the country at a rapid pace. NTD's Don Ma has the story. They've been pulling money out of China on a large scale since Russia attacked Ukraine. This suggests investors may be seeing China in a new light after how Beijing responded to the invasion. But a new IIF report also says it's premature to draw any definitive conclusions. Political scientist and economic analyst Ethan Yang says the outflow is due to a number of factors, including China's response to the Russian invasion. Investors don't like it when the regulatory environment uh, continues to change at a moment's notice. I mean, there's been a lot more uh, crackdowns on capital, uh, crackdowns on the stock market, crackdown on large companies, right? So investors are starting to realize that the Chinese government that was very friendly towards companies, very easygoing when it comes to allowing investment in the past, is no longer doing that. Other than capital outflow, businesses could be leaving too. A new survey by the European Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong found that Due to the city's current virus restrictions, 50% of the city's businesses are thinking about relocating in the next year, either partially or completely. It used to be this massive um, like GDP producer, and now it's more just a small component of the Chinese economy. Um, they're going to have to probably transition to something else besides global finance, or it'll just be a shell of itself, which again would be extremely sad. What about American businesses in mainland China? 75% say they will not increase investment in China. This is according to a recent survey by the American Chamber of Commerce in China. In Xinjiang, there's uh, allegations of slave labor, and so the U.S. has proceeded to ban cotton from Xinjiang, right? So you don't want to be a, a clothing manufacturer uh, with imports coming from Xinjiang. Uh, so basically, om- almost any investment you make in China could be subject to some sort of sanctions, some sort of restrictions someday, right? So that's kind of like the, the anxiety that comes out of this geopolitical tension. The survey found that more than 50 percent of businesses say U.S.-China tensions is the biggest obstacle to their business. In times of trouble, what are the most valuable resources a country can have? The answers may vary. But two things always top the list, food and energy. Looking at the energy issue, the U.S. is exporting oil to China. As a net petroleum exporter, 7 percent of U.S. oil exports went to China last year. Only three countries bought more oil from the U.S. than China did, Mexico, Canada and India. Right now, China is the world's largest oil importer. The country has dramatically increased its oil imports over the past two decades. Back then, China's oil imports were at approximately the same level as other developing countries like India. 
But in 2017, China's imports surpassed U.S. levels, and Beijing became the world's leading importer. And that growth from 2015 to 2019 amounts to over 40 percent of the world's total. But that's not all. The pandemic boosted that import ramp up even more. Starting late 2019, China's crude oil imports saw significant growth, totaling over 7 percent compared to the previous year. As for where China's getting that oil, Saudi Arabia, Russia and Iraq were among its top sources in 2020. But last year's numbers saw a shakeup. 2021 was the first year in decades that China's oil imports actually declined. According to Chinese customs data released early January, imports dropped by almost 5.5 percent. What was behind the decline? China's official report cited China's consolidation of private refineries for the drop. The report also noted rising crude oil prices, as the world is slowly stepping out of the pandemic shadow. But the Japanese media outlet Nikkei explains the drop differently. It says the lowered import figures reflect the decline in fuel demand amid the lockdown, coupled with slowed car sales due to low domestic demand. While China has become the world's largest crude oil importer, the title of world's largest oil consumer still goes to the U.S. The United States consumes nearly 20 million barrels a day. For comparison, China consumes just over 12 million barrels a day, ranking second after the U.S. China's wealthy are turning to Singapore to park their assets. Setting up family offices there has become one option for affluent Chinese who are looking to move money out of the country. It requires at least $5 million in assets, but provides a safe haven for those that can manage it. CNBC recently interviewed some of the Singapore firms involved in the business. An accounting and corporate services form says inquiries about setting up a family office in Singapore have doubled over the last 12 months, mostly from Chinese citizens or Chinese emigrants in Singapore. Singapore has proven an attractive option for two reasons, its large Chinese-speaking communities and the absence of a wealth tax. Singapore sits within the South China Sea, though unlike some of its neighbors, it doesn't have an ongoing dispute over nearby waters with Beijing.